Limb Salvage Video 5. This is an update for 2023. So the Limb Salvage videos uh, were broken up into four videos. Uh, the subtitles weren't really presented uh, in those videos, but uh, the first video pretty much was focused on open fracture management principles, antibiotics. The second video looked more at open fracture surgical management. Third video looked at bone loss management. And then the fourth video touched on soft tissue loss management, but focused a lot on outcome studies. Now, the video was from 2015, so it is now 2023. And the current video is really going to look to give you a little bit of an updated review of the literature of some of the important papers since 2015 on this topic. So let's look first at a couple of papers on amputation versus limb salvage. So the Metric Consortium, which is a large U.S.-based uh, research consortium that's basically the major extremity trauma research consortium, uh, which is funded by the uh, Department of Defense, has multiple large multicenter studies, uh, and, and this was one of them, the Outlet Study. This is published in JBJS in 2021, and this essentially is a multicenter prospective observational study, and uh, they looked at outcome scores. So they had enrolled 488 patients with limb salvage, 151 with amputation. Again, this is not randomized. This is an observational study. And uh, they looked at um, the musculoskeletal functional assessment scores, or short version. And they found that uh, at 18 months, uh, essentially patients who had undergone limb salvage uh, probably would have been a little bit better if they'd been amputated. I mean, that, that's probably the easiest way to, to summarize the findings in this study. Another large study, uh, not quite as large, but uh, the METALS study. If you may recall, in 2013, the METALS study, uh, which essentially was looked at um, military population, uh, in 2013, the, the findings were published on lower extremity limb salvage versus amputation. And uh, if you recall, there was a slight um, uh, preference, or I should say, that patients who had amputation had slightly better functional outcomes uh, than those who underwent limb salvage. So in 2019, uh, the METALS study, uh, study group actually published on upper extremity uh, unilateral upper extremities, se severe mangled extremities, and looked at, again, uh, SMFA scores. And again, this is a military population. And um, needless to say, long-term outcomes are not good. Uh, it's worth mentioning and not particularly surprising, but essentially equivalent uh, between amputation and limb salvage. Uh, and, and some of the things that uh, many of the papers in this topic have brought up and the metals group uh, pointed out in their paper was that uh, really need to address some of the non-orthopedic issues, really PTSD, depression, chronic pain that seem to drive the outcomes. Switching gears, we're going to look now at uh, a series of recent papers looking at timing of debridement and coverage of uh, lower extremity open fractures. Uh, so, again, if you uh, are dealing with limb salvage, one of the questions that comes to mind is uh, time to debridement, time to coverage, for instance. So this group uh, published a few papers. Uh, this is the first one, in JOT 2019, that I'm going to highlight. Here, looking at two-stage combined orthoplastic management of 3B open tibia fractures that needed flaps to see what you know there's a timing of debridement and the timing of coverage seem to be associated with outcomes like how quickly do you need to get them uh, to the or initially and then covered with plastics you know with the flap essentially uh, 148 patients uh, retrospective single center and um, notably the age group a little older than what we uh, often see at uh, some of our other centers 54 years old 
uh, looked at two-year follow-ups, a pretty good follow-up, surprisingly only four deep infections. So I thought the infection rate's fairly low, uh, and interestingly, a mean hour of 19 hours to debridement uh, when you look at the what was they were dealing with at their center. Um, longer time to initial debridement and definitive reconstruction was found to not be significantly associated with deep infection, flap loss, or infection. But this is a single center study. Same group, except now extended this to an international multi-center retrospective cohort study. So again, not randomized, uh, but looking at a lot of other centers um, or several other centers and 373 patients this time. So this was published in JOT 2023. This is fairly recent. And um, looked at deep infection rates again uh, and tried to correlate with timing between definitive fixation and flap coverage. So much higher deep infection rate this time, 20.6% um, compared to the previous study. Uh, and uh, not a significantly increased risk if you had a delay of coverage. Now, this paper is looking just at the, what is that window to get them flapped. So let's say you take a patient to the OR, you do your IND, eventually you bring them back, you fix them, but now you need to get them covered. Uh, if you wait up to two days, you might be okay. If you wait two to five days, that relative risk goes up to one and a half times that increases your risk of infection. And then more than five days, it goes up a little bit more. And those were statistically significant. Now, this paper, this is kind of their PRISMA diagram um, and uh, in the methods. And it basically, uh, I, what I like to focus on really is on the bottom here, where you can see that um, these were the, the patients uh, and how the groups broke down. So definitive fixation and immediate flap coverage. So basically, you take the patient to the OR, you coordinate with your plastic surgeon, and you fix it and flap it in the same shot, essentially. Um, 183 patients. So this is about half of the group. Um, definitive fixation uh, to flap coverage, delay of zero to two days, meaning you fix them, and then they come back the next day or in two days, uh, 51 patients. And then if it was a little bit more delayed, 49 patients. And you can see they still had a sizable number of patients who had definitive fixation and then flap coverage more than five days later, 24% of the group. So that's the that's how the patients break down essentially in that paper. Okay, so um, another study, uh, this is a different group, looked at same thing. W what happens when you have a delay in flap coverage and what constitutes a delay? So they defined it as greater than seven days. And this was published Journal of Orthopedic Trauma 2019, 672 patients at 140 centers. So uh, really tried to get a lot of groups to contribute their patients, retrospective, obviously. Uh, and they found that delayed coverage was associated with a significant increase in complications. Uh, and each additional week of delay had a 40% you know, increased risk of various complications. So what I found interesting in this particular paper is if uh, you look at some of their data here, so I'm focusing on the top left first, you can see you know, the debridements get done for the most part pretty quickly. Uh, and then as you'd expect, definitive fixation lags, you know, a lot of them 75% getting done within a week. Uh, and then the flap coverage seems to lag behind that, maybe you know, less than 50% at one week getting flapped. Uh, and then... Um, uh, it, if you move over here to the right, you can see that um, pretty much the, uh, if you look at the time of weeks from ED arrival, you can see how long patients are getting definitively fixed and then uh, the flap coverage. And you can see the slight difference between uh, patient groups who had isolated fractures um, or if you kind of excluded patients who were transferred in. Okay, so a lot of the same investigators uh, in this group um, as were in the first two studies, and this is the Goliath investigator group, and this was a paper published in JBGS 2021, and um, looking at a similar question. So what is the risk of infection based on time to debridement? Okay, going back to the first question, uh, when they come in, 
to the time that you actually do the debridement, uh, what is that delay? You know, what, what, what constitutes too much of a delay? You know, if there's a delay, there's an increased risk of infection, et cetera. So this time, this is a meta-analysis. So they looked at 84 studies, which included 18,000 patients. Uh, and, um, you know, they found that there is some association between timing of debridement and surgical site infection um, with an odds ratio of 1.29. Really, the major take-home from this particular paper was that it was really coming from the type 3s. So if you had a type 3 open fracture, uh, those are the ones that probably are going to cause more of an issue if you really wait too long. So odds uh, ratio of 1.51 at 12 hours and then jumps up to 2.17 at 24 hours time from presentation to debridement. So uh, if you have... So again, timing to debridement, we, it, it's its an issue. We still don't have a great answer for. A couple of recent studies have tried to tackle this. And I think the bottom line is um, uh, we still don't have great data saying that you have to get to the OR within six or eight hours, right? or it's traditional uh, teaching. Uh, but if you really start to get past 12 or 24 hours for the type 3 open fractures, you might have a problem. All right. Moving on to one other paper I do want to uh, present, which is on negative pressure wound therapy. So common technique uh, used in open fractures. So this is the WOLF randomized trial. This was published in Journal of American Medical Association 2018. This was a multicenter randomized control trial in the UK. And um, they basically looked to see, uh, does negative pressure wound therapy uh, versus, well, is there a difference between negative pressure wound therapy and standard wound uh, care um, when you compare them and look at disability at 12 months? So which which seems to be better or the equivalent? And um, they looked at what they called severe open fractures. And it's interesting, if you look at it, they included mostly type 3s, but there were some type 2s. So needless to say, they said that these were wounds that could not be closed right away. Um, so what they found really was that they're ultimately looking at um, uh, at their outcomes. There were really no differences in disability ratings, uh, deep surgical site infection, or quality of life uh, when they evaluated at 12 months. So interestingly, not a lot of support for the use of negative pressure wound therapy in severe open fractures in the lower extremity um, technique a lot of us use. And uh, interesting, if you look at some of their data, I think what's interesting to see here really is um, if you look at the disability ratings, look at where they are pre-injury, and of course, pretty significantly disabled post-injury, and then you look at over time by 12 months, still not doing great. I mean, we helped them to get from here to there, um, and the passage of time helps, but uh, you can see how far from pre-injury that they really are. Same thing if you look at uh, other um, outcome scores, pre-injury, post-injury, and by 12 months, they're still only up to here. So so those are some of the uh, recent publications uh, uh, looking at outcomes and the management of severe lower extremity uh, open fractures and limb salvage versus amputation uh, that I think can build upon what we learned in the first few videos and some of the slightly older literature now.